I have listened to enough rubbish from you. We are all now part of Modi's nation. You have no business making a personal attack on any of my panelists. Look at this. this it's is... all saffron. It was a fantastic speech. Thank you. <laughs> there was a lot of humor. Is India's media facing a credibility crisis? Let's take a look. In February last year in Kashmir, a deadly terrorist attack killed 40 Indian soldiers. This is how the media reacted. Biggest ever attack on our Indian forces in Kashmir. Not condemnation, we want revenge. There has to be a forefront war against Pakistan. Shut them down. No visa, no cricket. The narrative quickly turned into a call for war against Pakistan. We will tell you what is the end of the world. What can we do if we have to take Pakistan from India? Many people are saying that we need to start with the war. The war has been started. India has struck Pakistan and we have struck them hard. And most importantly, we have struck them straight in the face. It's not just Kashmir. In June, the government froze state advertising to several newspaper groups, something senior executives at the papers claim was in retaliation to reports they published that criticised the government. Uh, we are supposed to question the people in power. But what has happened in the past five and a half years is that the media has become a stooge of the ruling government. They have stopped questioning the ruling government and to make matters worse, they have been propagating the divisive and even the negative uh, agenda of the ruling party. A string of high-profile resignations at ABP News last year laid bare the extent of the pressure journalists are under. You would say something on air, uh, you know, as an anchor or as a journalist, or if you uh, wrote something on Twitter, you know, uh, they would kind of pressurize you in different ways. There was a person called Dripendra Mishra in the Prime Minister's office and he would actually make calls to the proprietors, to the editors and of course, uh, you know, point out something that uh, the government was not very comfortable about. So yes, this government has been working in different ways to pressurize uh, the media. Apisar's exit came a few weeks after the resignation of managing editor Milind Khandekar and anchor Punya Prasun Bajpai. But you could say the writing was on the wall. In 2018, when ABP called out Modi for a claim he made that farmers were doubling their income as a result of his policies. <laughs> They sent a reporter to interview the farmer who denied it. After leaving, Bajpai wrote an expose detailing the extent of censorship. From being told not to take Narendra Modi's name on my show or show his image on any program critical of the government, to a sinister blacking out of my show Masterstroke, what happened was nothing short of censorship. He goes on to say, The message, sharp and clear, to every news channel was this. Go against us and your business will suffer. Threats and violence is becoming a new normal for journalists in India. Around 50 have lost their lives within the last 12 years. The country has slipped in the World Press Freedom Index to 140 out of the 180 countries listed. That's behind Afghanistan and South Sudan. Rigorous journalism is still taking place, mostly through online outlets. I am, in a way, doing uh, five shows for two digital platforms. Because digital platforms, uh, the kind that I work for, uh, one is called News Click and the second one is called HW News. And even other digital platforms, whether it's The Wire, whether it's The Quint, they are the ones who are doing actual journalism. Uh, as I said, uh, mainstream news channels, whether news uh, papers or TV news channels, are under a lot of pressure from the ruling government. But a lack of viable funding models means the future of these portals hang in the balance. And with a deficit of critical voices to hold the powers that be accountable, there's plenty at stake. Will a lack of media freedom lead to the death of democracy in India?